Good evening, my dear friends, to our Friday night spiritual webinar on the Christian mystics. And it's now part 19. And tonight we're introducing you to another new Christian mystic, Nicholas of Cusa. But before we begin, let us just be still. I don't know about you, but for many people, Friday night is time to wind down, especially if they've had a busy day with the family or in the office or maybe in the, the super mall. But however, let's just retreat from the mind and come back to the heart. And as we sit in quiet contemplation, let us use the greatest gift that God has given to us, the gift of free will. Let us now invite, invoke, and call upon our Father, Mother, God Supreme in the presence of all the great spiritual teachers of the past, the present and to come, in the presence of the angelic realm, the ascended masters, the beings of light, and all the holy men and women of all faiths and none who bask in the eternal city of love. We take a deep breath. We hold it, and now we breathe out any tension or stress to Mother Earth, to Gaia, and just relax. And now connect with the rhythm of your breathing and be still. Be still and know that you are truly loved as a child of God. And you don't have to do anything to win God's favor other than surrender your heart. And now we begin with our beautiful prayer given to us by none other than the great Teresa of Avila, a Spanish mystic, a Carmelite nun who reformed the Carmelite order. But this prayer isn't just for Christians. It's been used by Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, Sikh, Jew. I cross the bridge into the silent bliss of my castle, my soul. I close the drawbridge and forbid all outside influences from entry into this holy place, a place that is my soul. Here in my castle, I am alone with my God and under God's light and companionship, I discover the depth and the beauty of my own soul. I embrace the power of prayer. I open myself to divine guidance. I surrender myself to become as a channel for grace, healing, and service as God directs my life. Stay with those words and allow the energy behind each word, each vowel sound, resonate with your heart, your teacher, the gateway to your soul, the gateway to God. going to read one of the reflections we read last evening. In all faces is seen the face of faces, veiled in a billion riddles, yet unveiled it is not seen, until at last, above all faces we enter into a certain secret 
and mystical silence where there is no knowledge of a face. Nicholas of Cusa. And Matthew Fox interprets this as the 15th century mystic and scientist Nicholas of Cusa speaks in paradoxical language of the riddle of the mirror. How our small f faces reflect the big f face of God. Yet even when unveiled, God's face remains unseen. Every face mirrors something of divinity, and yet we cannot describe what divinity looks like. God is seen, but not seen. Creatures who are faces of God reveal God, but they do not reveal God. Then, when we do enter into the silent and mysterious divine presence, we enter a place beyond faces and individuality. Nothingness remains. And that takes us still closer to the divine face. And Nicholas says, this mist, this cloud, this darkness into which we go, transcending knowledge, is the path below which your face cannot be found except veiled. But it is that very darkness which reveals your face is there beyond all veils beautiful. And Matthew interprets this as Cusa anticipates psychoanalytic exploration into the unconscious when he speaks of journeying to a place of darkness and transcending knowledge and the veiling of our face. But the darkness is welcoming. It holds a revelation, an unveiling of our true selves, of our authentic face. This is another way of talking of the dark night of the soul, which many of us have on the spiritual journey. A dark night of the soul which has so much truth to teach us. Have you made this journey yourself? Would you dare to journey to find the unveiled face within your darker self? Would you? It takes a lot of courage. But guess who gives us the courage? Absolutely. And Nicholas says, O oh God, the longer I gaze upon your face, the more acutely do you seem to turn the gaze of your eyes upon me. Thus, when I meditate on how that face is, truth and the best measure of all faces, I am expanded into a state of immense wonder. Those who look upon you with a loving face will find your face looking on them with love. Those who look upon you in hate will similarly find your face hateful. Those who gaze at you in joy will find your face joyfully reflected back at them. Oh, and Matthew explains this a bit further by saying, Cusa echoes Eckhart's observation that the eye with which I see God is the same eye with which God sees me. The face-to-face -face gaze we experience with God 
certainly inspires wonder. A pure subject to subject gaze with no objects. But Eckhart teaches that all the names we give to God come from an understanding, yes, of ourselves. Thus the quality of the gaze depends on what we bring to this encounter, on the quality of our being. In speaking of love or hate emanating from God's face, is Kuzi teaching about karma? Put out love and you receive love. Put out hate and you conjure up hate. Put out joy and joy is reflected back to you. Does this match your experience? And Nicholas of Cusa shares this, O Divine One, all beauty which can be conceived is less than the beauty of your face. Though every face is beautiful, no face is beauty self but your face. God, Goddess, has beauty and this having is being. It is absolute beauty itself, which is the form that gives being to every beautiful form. It is absolute beauty itself, which is the form that gives being to every beautiful form. I wonder what Matthew Fox is to share about that. Well, he says, Kuza reveals his understanding of the importance of beauty in our understanding of divinity. Only God's face is beauty itself. But this is the beauty not of appearance or form, but of being. God does not have beauty as creatures do. God's being, absolute beauty itself, is the source for every beautiful form. Thus beauty is a worthy path to God. And God wants it that way. Can you recognise in all forms the beautiful expression of God's being. Well, can you? I like Matthew Fox because he always puts his finger on the pulse and he succinctly explains so that the heart understands. An amazing prophet is Matthew, is Matthew Fox. Now, Nicholas of Cusa shares this. Anyone who understands that the great variety of things is a reflected image of the one God and leaves behind the diversity in all the images will arrive in an incomprehensible manner at the incomprehensible. A wee bit above my head that, but let's read what Matthew says. Leaving behind the diversity in all the images counsels Kusa. It's hard to comprehend how to do this. And yet this very simple path is the only one leading to the incomprehensible. This is a basic teaching about meditation. Let the particulars go. Let self go. Sink into nothingness the void, silence, darkness, where no image shines. In the darkness, deep encounters happen. The incomprehensible speaks its own language amid the silence of things. Now I get it. Do you? I hope you do. 
And now we have a beautiful reflection from Nicholas of Cusa. Divinity is the enfolding of the universe, and the universe is the unfolding of divinity. The human mind is the enfolding of its own dream world, and its own dream world is the unfolding of the human mind. Divinity is the unfolding, is the enfolding and unfolding of everything that is. Divinity is in all things in such a way that all things are in divinity. Mind itself, supposing itself to encompass, survey and comprehend all things, thus concludes that it is in everything and everything is in it. And Matthew says, Kuza likes very much to play with the themes of enfolding and unfolding. There is a Mobius strip like infinite loop quality to this dynamic, expanding and contracting, embracing and revealing that plays out on every level. The human mind both enfolds its dreams, its dream world and unfolds as it does so. In creation at large, God is the enfolding of the universe and the universe is the unfolding of divinity. And God is also the enfolding of all things while in pantheistic fashion, all things are in God. Have you experienced this sense of endless connection flowing in and out, asks Matthew. And Nicholas says, when indeed the human mind, the clear likeness of God, participates as it is able in the fertility of the creative nature, it puts forth from itself as the image of the divine form, symbolic entities in the likeness of real beings. Thus the human mind is the form of the symbolic world, just as the divine mind is that of the real world. And Matthew explains this clearly. Like Aquinas, Cusa is comparing human creativity to that of the Spirit of God or the divine mind at work in the world. Humans participate in the fertility of the creative nature of God. That is what it means to be made in the image and likeness of God. That is what it means to be made in the image and likeness of God. It means we are in touch with our creativity and we respect and honor it in others. Like Aquinas, Cusa attributes human creativity to our likeness to the divine artist. We reflect the divine creativity and art. We see once again how important creativity was to the pre-modern consciousness. Modern consciousness has not given it this profound setting. We thus reduce and manipulate creativity strictly for commercial success to sell goodies, to make celebrities, and to build the human ego. How tragic. And Nicholas of Cusa shares this. Peace is the bearing of fruit of the mind. It is the dwelling place of divinity, the divine locus. Contemplation is living in peace. Can I read that again? 
Peace is the bearing of fruit of the mind. It is the dwelling place of divinity, the divine locus. Contemplation is living in peace. And what does Matthew say? Contemplation brings peace. It is living in peace. Peace is the fruition of the work of the mind. We seek peace. Eckhart says, we run into peace. All things seek, seek peace in response. Divinity dwells there. We taste that peace in contemplation. We taste the divine presence. Mm. And another beautiful reflection from Nicholas of Cusa, the Logos of creation in whom all things were created can be nothing, nothing other than divine wisdom. Thus, it is that wisdom is eternal, for it precedes every beginning and all created reality. And Matthew says, Kuzi connects the cosmic Christ as, as logos or word with the cosmic Christ as wisdom. They are the same. Wisdom precedes all beginnings and all creation. Wisdom was there from before the beginning of the world. Let's reflect. Just let's take a breather. What is the Spirit of God saying to your heart from the reflections I've shared with you? Beautiful words. Shall we proceed? Okay. Nicola of Cusa says, Humanity will find that it is not a diversity of creeds, but the very same creed which is everywhere proposed. There cannot but be one wisdom. If it were possible to have many wisdoms, these would have to be from one. For before any plurality exists, there must first be unity. Wise objection, a wise observation. Humans must therefore all agree that there is but one simple wisdom whose power is infinite. And everyone in explaining the intensity of this beauty must discover that it is a supreme and terrible beauty. Mm. And Matthew says, I see Kusa speaking from the 15th century to the movement of deep ecumenism in our time. He says that while humans profess various creeds, there is really only one creed. And that is wisdom. Wisdom is simple yet infinite, and to apprehend it is to recognize a supreme and terrible beauty. This beauty is not the same as pretty. It relates to awe and even terror. My word. Kusa challenges us to move beyond parochial creeds to recognize this one supreme and terrible beauty that is wisdom. Are we up to the challenge? Are you up to the challenge? Mm. Well, I am. And another beautiful reflection, the Lord of sky and earth has heard the groans of those who have been slaughtered and imprisoned and reduced to slavery and to suffer because of religious wars. 
the Creator is moved with compassion towards humanity and will try to guide all the variety of religions to one greater, unimpeachable harmony in which all opinion is one. And Matthew says, Kusa is decrying the price innocent people have so often paid for violent religious crusades and pogroms and inquisitions. He promises that God will eventually clean up religion and move it beyond warfare and conquest and proselytizing to a greater unimpeachable harmony. In the meantime, how are we doing? In this 21st century, how are we doing? Do we still believe that our belief, our personal belief, is the only one? Well, having read that, all beliefs are all part of the one creed, wisdom. So let us spend this last few minutes just reflecting on what we've read. And let us call on the Spirit of God, a spirit of all-knowing, selfless love, to come and to speak to our hearts. Maybe we're insecure, maybe we're in a rut, maybe we are full of religion and no spirituality. As Jesus said, they honour me with their lips, their hearts are far from me. Is your heart closed to the Spirit of God? In most cases it's closed because of fear, maybe indoctrination, afraid of being singled out and caused troublemaker. But if we hear that voice of wisdom and we embrace it and surrender to it, then we need courage to honour it. But there is a price to pay, and that price is usually rejection from within one's own family, be it birth family or religious family. It takes courage to listen to your heart, to honour it, to follow it, and to walk with God as God directs your life, not as your bishop or your priest or your imam or your rabbi tells you how to live your life. It is God who directs your heart. Men and women ordained in the presence of God to carry out God's word so often gets watered down or corrupt by their own personal agenda. So if ever there's an element of disquiet, always come back to the source, to God, and ask God, is what you're hearing for your highest good? Is there fear? Has it left you in fear? If it has, check it out. Check it out in prayer with God. And again, Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name, I will do for you. And he wants you to challenge all the doctrines that are thrown at you because they're not all of God. Often man has contaminated doctrines of God and shackle the children of God to a miserable life of fear and guilt and self-loathing. Always douse the answers before accepting them. Let us be still. And let us give thanks to God for this great Christian mystic Nicholas of Cusa and for Matthew Fox as well, for explaining to us the depths of the meaning 
and of the heart of this good man, Nicholas of Cusa. And as we come to leave our castle, our soul, we share this beautiful prayer of exit with you. I am a channel of grace. As I leave my castle, grace surrounds me and grace protects me. I enter my life under the blessing of God and forbid all outside influences from leading me astray and I remain open to receive guidance from my soul. Be at peace. Savor the words. Bless the words. And thank you for being here with me this Friday night. Namaste. Shalom. Inshallah, Paikset Bonum Om Shanti, Solo di Carita, Salam Alaikum, and may the peace of your God Goddess empower you, love yourself, honor the divine within you, and become that loving co creator of God. Look forward to your company again soon.